suddenly you start asking the question like, what is the point of the score? Because I have a cheat code. Here are three things I think that you do if you want your framework to work in a copilot enabled world. So rock on lazy developers. That's, <laughs> we prove that we have longevity. I would want to see that we still have innovation and we keep staying at the bleeding edge. I would want Nux to be that. So I don't want to build the empire of Nux. I want to build something that will make people's lives better. It seems to be something that you, you worry of, from what I understand. It's interesting. Let's, it's let's inside knowledge there. <laughs> let's cut it here. How can open source truly stay open? And what does it take to push an open source framework forward? We spoke with Daniel Rowe, the head of the Nux core team, to get his opinion on all of this and more. Hey everybody, Phil from Prismic here. I am in the surprisingly cold and snowy Bordeaux in the Nuxt offices with the Nuxt core team lead, Daniel Rowe, who has just flown in from the equally cold and blustery Edinburgh uh, to talk with us today uh, a little bit about his role here at Nuxt and where the team is going and just general tech talk. So. Can you uh, introduce yourself just to some of the viewers who might uh, not be aware of your position here and what you do? Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here. I um, So yes, my name's uh, Daniel. I, I lead the Next Core team. I'm a full-time open source maintainer, uh, which means I, I get to spend my time doing what I love, uh, which, is, which is looking after the, the open source framework um, Next, um, a framework for building web applications using Vue. Um, I, I'm based in Edinburgh, which I've only just moved to just about a week ago. I have a cat, mm -hmm. um, which is she's very fluffy. She's very fluffy <laughs> and has a very, very penetrating mew. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm not originally from, from the UK. Uh, in fact, I'm originally from the US. Oh. So I'm a, an interloper in, uh, in, in, in Great Britain, so. Citizen of the world. Citizen, well, I'd, I'd love that. That would be <laughs> aspirational for sure. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I'm happy to talk with you today. I'm happy to be in your lovely offices here in Bordeaux. So you've just moved to Edinburgh from Durham and you were a founder of the Durham Young Professionals Association, right? So originally I had a, I had a creative agency and some friends of mine founded uh, the Durham Young Professionals. and. Either immediately or very quickly after, I also was on the on the. It was, we, I did the uh, the logo and the, and the website and stuff like that, and uh, that it was it was really nice to create, um, because I I had moved to this place to Durham uh, with no background or knowledge of anyone there, and I had started a business, um, never having run a business before, so everything was totally new, and I was trying to figure out you know to meet people, other, other business owners, the, the, the local community, um, as well as make friends and uh, sort of get settled in a new place. It was, it was totally just sort of drop you in a new place and, and get going. And, uh, and yes, I, I made a lot of mistakes with the company. I learned a lot of things through that, but I uh, had an amazing time. And so this is one of the things that we did uh, as we were starting off. We, uh, we created this Durham Young Professionals brand and website. And that was a great opportunity, sort of networking with other people of similar age and stage. That's awesome. And you're a strong advocate and supporter of the, the developer community in the Northeast as well. I, um, I, I absolutely. So, I mean, I, I really, um, I think I'm, a, I'm an extrovert developer. I really, I, I, I really, really like um, meeting people and talking to people and uh, getting to know people. Um, you know, GitHub is, is, is great. You know, you're, you're collaborating with people from all around the world, but nothing for me quite is as exciting as meeting someone in person at a meetup or an event and like recognizing them from their avatar. <laughs> and like, yeah, so you've collaborated about this or that. It's so much fun. And so whenever I get a chance to go to a, like a, a local meetup, I'm giving a talk at a conference this coming year, um, just around the corner in Middlesbrough. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is going to be a lot of fun as well. Okay, so. that's awesome. And, and for you, what's, what's special about, about Durham, where you're from, and, and about the development community and, and everyone around there? For you, it's probably something that's close to your heart, uh, just where you're from. So, well, I mean, one of the things for me is that 
because I'm not originally from Durham, so mm -hmm. I've just uh, moved to it. Um, I, I think a lot of the developers I meet are the same. So they're working asynchronously. Uh, they might not have a local office there. Um, I, I mean, there, there are the there are the companies that are that are that are local, uh, but then there are lots and lots of developers who who choose it because they were from the northeast originally, or because they've they've moved to this beautiful city, and they're they're working from the the cafes and the and so on. And I think this has happened a lot after COVID mm -hmm. that people have gone from, you know, the the busy London um, apartment, the tiny tiny place, and they they've ch chosen to move out somewhere where there's more space, where there's a bit of, um, you know, people smile at you in the streets <laughs> and, you know, there's this sort of warmth and community and the Northeast absolutely has that, which I, I love, honestly, it's great. Yeah, and that's a, that's a really interesting topic that you brought up, that that slight change in that you're in Edinburgh, we've got people in, in Durham, we're here in Bordeaux, you know, a lot of developers uh, and tech companies are in now in smaller cities, but there is still a lot of concentration in the larger cities in London, Paris, Los Angeles, mm. San Francisco, so all these places. Do you see that changing or do you, do you see there still being a concentration there in the future? I mean, I still think that there will be, yes, there'll be pockets because, because we like working together with other people. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I would absolutely go and, uh, and go to a different city in order to work with somebody else. Um, so I've been to Amsterdam to work with Puya and Alex Schlichter on the uh, the, call, uh, the the Nux team and others as well. To but to Paris to meet up with Anthony and Eduardo and uh, do some co-working there. And that is that is a lot of fun. Uh, but when you can actually have people who are living in the same city, I think that that will will um, absolutely continue. One company who does does this. Interestingly, I don't know if you've come across them, is uh, Cal.com. So they, they make a, um, a Calendly replacement. Mm -hmm. It's open source. It's free. You should definitely uh, sign up. Um, but the, they have a policy for their company that they, they have a sort of um, the, the salary band is fixed no matter where you live on the, in the world. Okay. And they, cool. will, they offer a relocation service. So when you, when you sign up, they say, okay, hey, we, we offer you this relocation service through, some, uh, through a platform they use. We will help you move anywhere in the world. So you can take the salary you'll, you'll get. And yes, it will be a bit lower than your Silicon Valley or your London salary. Mm -hmm. But why don't you let us move you to some peaceful island wow. in the, the Caribbean where you, or, or you know, some off the coast of Spain or whatever. And isn't that an amazing offer? That's incredible. Don't, don't you think that's... A, yeah, a, that's, that's a, <laughs> so like out of the box, like it's crazy. Right. It's awesome. Next week you're going to be a plant. No, no. I'm <laughs> but but I mean, but that's the kind of thing that async, like unleashes. I think, and that's hot. You can't put that back in the box. Um, so I think there there will of course still be be people in the, these centres like uh, London and Paris, mm. but um, but not everybody, and I think that's that's a good thing. Yeah, that's awesome, and um, <clears throat> and uh, given that. You are in Edinburgh and you're the, the lead of the Knox core team here. How, how do you find that working relationship, uh, given that a lot of the team are based in France and, and different places, how does that work for you on a day-to-day -day basis? So uh, time zones are much more, um, in, uh, have much more of an impact, I think, because it's those sync meetings that we have, the video calls or, or the audio calls uh, we have with the team. Uh, and actually, we're still in in the same time zone. Uh, so we've got uh, Amsterdam, we've got Paris, Edinburgh, um, and that's all relatively relatively close. Yeah, there's like one hour difference really between them. Yeah, um, I'm more worried about how do we make sure that we're not too dependent on that because it's not like we only want to have a core team. <laughs> within a couple of hours. Mm. So, you know, when we have core team members who are in, um, in China or in the US, mm -hmm. it's going to be a bit more difficult. Um, and we already have that with our broader team. So we have the Nuxt Insiders team who are maybe 20, 30 people, and they are from all over, including Australia. And it is very difficult to find times for those sync meetings. So, of course, what we do is we have 
discussion so people can update asynchronously. We record all the meetings so people can watch them later if they can't make it. Mm -hmm. um, but still, that's, that's something we want to make sure we don't have some kind of barrier to, uh, to people contributing because mm -hmm. they're in the wrong place. Um, so being in Edinburgh won't, I don't um, or, or, or London or, or anywhere else, I don't think would be a meaningful um, obstacle to collaborating for me or, or anyone else on the team because most of what we do is async. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, on GitHub, probably we don't have meetings most of the time. Most of it is Discord chat and creating pull requests and, and writing and all the kinds of things that you can easily do from anywhere. Okay, very cool. And I know we've had to tackle some of those challenges at Prismic because we do have uh, one team member in Hawaii. Ah. And so like Tanji is awesome for him. Have you not just considered moving the team? We have had so many requests for team buildings in Hawaii <laughs> that I think everyone in the com company has requested it. <laughs> and, uh, but what we've seen is like everyone has to make an extra effort and with those longer time zone changes, you know, yeah. if, if we want to do a meeting, people will say, OK, I'm going to shift my day a little bit so that I can get that face to face time mm. with, with uh, this person. I think it might also make a difference for me and for the for next is that it's not work. So I'm mm. You know, I'm gonna, I do this and I'm a full-time open source maintainer, but I'm not employed to do it. So, and it's also, this is also a problem. So how, what do you do with working hours? So I don't have a problem with taking a call in the evening. So mm -hmm. I've had calls at 8, 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I, it's fine. Too, too much of that maybe I would um, find... I <laughs> can maybe a bit too tired, uh, candle burning at both ends. But but a little bit is fine because I do this because I enjoy it. And so if I need to collaborate with someone in you know Pacific time zone in the U.S., it's not not a big deal. Yeah, that's that's important. Like you said, when it doesn't feel like work, taking a call doesn't seem like a big thing. It's like just having a conversation. Yeah, that's awesome. And and how did you? Um, get to the position where you're at now, how did you end up becoming the, the Nox Core? team lead. Where, where were you just before? What were you doing and how did you end up here? So what I was doing just before, uh, so I, when I moved to Durham, I started a creative agency yeah. focusing on clarity of writing. Yeah. Uh, and that was because I had previously studied law and I had been a vicar as well, so leading a church. Yeah, so that you did theological studies or something like that? Yeah, exactly. It's very interesting. Um, and so uh, I started this company with my, my dad and my wife, and we focused on, on, on writing and words. Uh, so the company was called Concision. It was all about simplicity, clarity. And very quickly, we needed to actually add tech digital side of things. So we would identify the core message, but a message is nothing if you don't communicate it. And mm -hmm. you need words, but you also need you need technology, you need a website, you need a logo. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we started doing that as well. And I was doing uh, the most of that. And we gradually built the team up and became a full creative agency. And then, uh, then we acquired one of our clients, a, a software as a service company that, where we had built their tech stack. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I then became the CTO of that and we brought on the, the team. Um, and so we, we sort of morphed. That was a lot of fun. Mm. I really, really enjoyed that. And I think that was just about the time I discovered Nuxt because we were originally doing stuff in you know, WordPress and I don't know, static HTML and stuff like that. And, uh, and so we just discovered Nuxt. And so then as a, I still remember my uh, lead developer when I basically, he was a week into a project and I said, hey, you know, WordPress, we're not going to use that for this project. We're going to use this thing called Nuxt. <laughs> What on earth are you doing to me? Like, you're just changing, you're throwing a new tech stack I have no experience with. Um, but we did, and it was great, and he, he's, he's very glad now. But, uh, but I think for a while he was, he was not, not very happy. And it was, it was Nuxt and a, and a CMS, I assume, if you were replacing WordPress at the time. It's okay if it wasn't Prismic, because I'm not going <laughs> to get hurt. It's fine. Actually, I think it, there, was no, there was, wasn't much of a CMS, because you know, I think it was it was pretty much fully designed, mm -hmm. but but yeah, WordPress I guess did did provide some editing 
functionality for the client, which obviously they, they will, have, will have lost. Mm. Um, and so you had them switch over into this project? We the... switched to Nuxt and, and basically uh, involvement in open source for Nuxt was, oh, we've encountered a bug, or here's a feature we'd love to see, I'll just put a PR in. And that was so much fun. You know, open source just, it really opens the doors. Was that your discovery of open source, this project? So it wasn't, f I guess I, I had played around with Linux for forever, mm -hmm. uh, like when, when I was a teenager. But no, I'd never contributed. Oh, no, I, I, had, I had contributed a little bit open source in the WordPress community. So there was, there's a great roots um, ecosystem uh, that aims to bring some of the Laravel improve, uh, like managing independencies with Composer mm -hmm. into the WordPress uh, world. And so I had been involved with that. But, uh, but yes, I guess that was the, the start of my, and I, I mean, I loved it. It was great because I really think this, I think open source is all about giving. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it does also benefit you. It's, it's, you're, you're solving your own problems, but you're also, give, you could solve those problems yourself mm -hmm. and keep them to yourself, but instead you can give them to other people and they also can solve their problems and give them to you, give the solutions to you. And you get this really lovely uh, place where you know, you're collaborating with people you don't have to collaborate with and you are benefiting and helping people. You don't, you're not, you wouldn't have, you know, it's, it's, it's free of obligation mm -hmm. and that really brings a lot of joy. So anyway, we did, we did that and I, I, I kept on contributing, I guess, to Nuxt. Uh, in the end, we chose to shut down this, the company. What was your next step towards uh, working with Nuxt? So, well, I guess <coughs> the, by that point, I was already a, ma a Nuxt maintainer. So uh, Sebastian had reached out to me and said, hey, we've, we've seen you uh, sort of collaborating on, on, I'd been doing some stuff with serverless. We, had, we were hosting our, our platform on, uh, on Vercel. Uh, and so there was a, a Vercel builder that I was helping maintain. Um, and we were wondering if you wanted to join the next team. And honestly, I felt so honored. It was just incredible to, um, to have the, you know, the author of a framework you're using actually say, we appreciate what you're doing. I mean, Goodness, that hits me right here. Um, and so I was, a, I was the next maintainer. Um, and I think he had asked me to join the core team as well. And, and at this point, we were starting to think about Nux 3 because Vue 3 had come out mm. um, or was coming out. And it's really exciting. You know, what is this next major upgrade going to be? And so, you know, I had just joined the Nux team. Um, when I, and it was in that context that I, I sh um, decided to, to sh shut up shop for my, my, the SaaS company I was running, mm -hmm. and uh, and the plan was I would I'd be a, I'd probably freelance for a while before I decided what what to do next. Um, but almost immediately, when Sebastian found out that I was available, as it were, he said, "Hey, hey, hey, can we sponsor you to work full time on open source?" Wow, that's cool. Which I, I know is amazing. Um, I'm not sure that's an offer that happens very often. No, it's an incredible <laughs> opportunity. And so I, I said, I would love to. And basically, so it was pretty much immediate. Um, and at that point, then it was, I think Puya was also sponsored. Uh, Puya and I and Sebastian and Anthony joined later on. Uh, but we were, we sort of rolled up our sleeves and started on Nux3. Mm -hmm. and built it from scratch. Like, I, I'm not sure there's a line of code the same from Nux2 to Nux3. Uh, and it went through lots of iterations. Yeah. Um, but we had, it was a lot of fun. That was, that was phenomenal. Then that was, what was it? Was it? That's why you needed that Nux bridge as well, wasn't it? Yeah, the bridge. Uh, yeah, Nux bridge. Um, basically, we are we were developing these things in parallel, so wanting to build Nux3, mm -hmm. but aware that this is a complete paradigm shift from Nux2. Mm -hmm. So can we provide an intermediate module mm -hmm. for Nux2 that lets people start writing code that would work in Nux3, mm -hmm. um, or migrating modules so that they would um, have the same module format, but work in both Nux2 and Nux3. And uh, so that, that then development of Nux2 bridge, um, which I'll probably actually be releasing this week, uh, the final version. 
Uh, but the, the development of, of Nux Bridge and Nux 3 then sort of went in parallel um, and actually sort of influenced each other back and forth. And when you were working on that Nux 3 release, were, were you the Nux uh, core lead at that moment or was it after? No, no, it was after. So the, the release was November, December um, last year, mm -hmm. being 2022. Uh, and then it was 2023, uh, January 23, that, that I was asked to be the, uh, the core team lead, mm -hmm. which was an incredible and also an incredibly rare thing. Because if you've, so um, Sebastian and Alexander uh, Chopin mm -hmm. had written Nuxt. Uh, and then they, they welcomed uh, Puya as a, um, a key early contributor. Uh, and then he became the lead of the framework uh, for all the time we were building Nuxt 3. And then to now have another core team lead to be, uh, to ask someone else. Um, to do it. That's a very unusual thing to have a framework or any kind of open um, uh, project where the governance is so, I would say, well put together mm -hmm. that you can have that, that transition of, of power where there's not some kind of someone clenching um, their fingers onto something that they've, they've created. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, it's something that um, I think is very unique about Sebastian. He's very... Um, he is almost looks for opportunity to empower other people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's partly why he was able to build uh, the ecosystem, the next ecosystem um, that is, is still so active because it is, it's not that he is clutching, holding everything tight. You know, he actually is empowering. Yeah. And actually even the, the way that next is built, which is that it is built to be extended, um, meaning that people can create modules for it which completely change how it works. Mm -hmm. It's all about, in a sense, sharing power and sharing responsibility. I mean, still, uh, Sebastian and Puya are both on the core team. Mm -hmm. We work together, collaborate together. So it's, they've not gone anywhere, you no. know. Um, but it is, I think, a, a thing that's, that is unique yeah. about the next governance and also about the next community and philosophy. Yeah, and it must be so reassuring to know that someone trusts you completely in that sense and they're like, here's, Here's the handoff. We want you to take it where you think you can, and know that they're behind you. Yeah, I think that that's 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 right. It's it is a lovely. It's it's a really lovely feeling. But I also think it is. It's also reassuring for the um, the sort of future of the framework. You think it's we don't have a bus factor. Nobody is so essential to the project that we couldn't just actually transition to a different lead. Mm. Which also makes you feel a little bit, you know, you, you're in your place a little bit. It's in, in a good way, mm -hmm. you know. You can't can't let your head get exactly too too big for you know, for, for for the rest of you. So. And and how does how does that how does that change for you from from working on the project to leading the project? What was your everyday change? Do you how did you find the balance from guiding and leading other people from following along with plans and and working day by day on something? I think, I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, of differences. One of the key differences, I think, is the death of the ego, as in, because. I mean, something I I do enjoy. I enjoy building something cool. I I love showing it off. That's one of the great things about open source, right? You build something amazing, you show it off to other people. They get excited. You know, that's that's great. But when you are when your aim is to guide a framework and make sure it's successful, mm -hmm. then what's most important is not that you are building cool things and showing them off to other people. I mean, the, you could probably do that, but the framework, would I wouldn't consider that a successful framework because it's just tied to one person. Really, the thing that I need to be doing is, is empowering other people to build the cool things and for other people to be creating PRs that are what we need. And, you know, intellectually, I know that. And it's still hard. You know, it's not, not hard because I, I um, begrudge it in any way, but hard because it, that's time that I don't have to, to do those things. Mm -hmm. too. And I think everyone finds that, probably. Yeah, a lot Who, of leaders go through that same kind of feeling of, 
have to let go, but I want to do it still. Absolutely. And I guess in open source, there's still an opportunity to do both. Mm -hmm. Like you still do have an opportunity to, to build them. But I mean, I do think that transition is one that is, is tough. Uh, just, you know, on a, on a personal level. Uh, there's still huge rewards from it because on the other hand, when you see people making amazing PRs that you've had nothing to do with, you know, that is also a great feeling it's like, mm -hmm. because it's bugs are being fixed. You didn't know existed. <laughs> you know, features are being built that now that you see them are great. <laughs> you know, that this is, this is uh, exciting that you, you have a momentum that's not just created by yourself. Um, so that feels incredible too. That it must be very rewarding, but it, it's not to say that you're not uh, still a pro prolific coder as seen through your, through your website and through your Twitch and your Twitter and your, your GitHub repository where you made over 8,000 contributions last year. You're still pretty prolific. Well, maybe, maybe you mean, I, maybe I should be less. Uh, do, do a bit less, maybe that's... Uh, no, but I'm, 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 my, my question is, do you still see yourself more now from within that role as still, I'm still a coder every day, or I'm leading the team now, do you think you've made that shift, even though you're still putting out a, a, a lot of lines of code every year? I think one of the things I like about um, uh, open source and about leading an open source project is that there, it's, it's not so... That the, it, it's not just one thing, mm -hmm. because there is there, there's helping people out on Discord on GitHub issues. There is um, coming up with new ideas and coding them. There is uh, fixing bugs. There is the the infrastructure kind of stuff. How do we make sure that um, when we are upgrading uh, that people's projects don't break, mm -hmm. or we provide ways for them to upgrade without breaking? There is uh, governance and how are we going to have a team? There is uh, helping people and empowering them to contribute. And there are all of these different things and I love the fact that I get to do all of them. So I still do, yeah, code every day. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure that I want to get to a place where I'm not coding. Although I did see <laughs> on your Twitter when someone mentioned your over 8,000 contributions, you said, um, all these green spots doesn't mean quality and impact and that you would maybe less activity would be more healthy. Yeah. What did you mean by that more healthy in this case? Well, exactly. So, I mean, I think, so, I mean, I, I don't mind. I, I, the main thing that I want to communicate there is that I don't want, so um, GitHub contributions are lots of things. They are, they are commits, they are reviews of other people, of other people's code, they are creating issues and discussions, and there's lots of things. But there's a danger, a huge danger for, for coders that we have a sort of scoreboard type mentality, right? Like we want to get the high score. And the, one of the great dangers is burnout. Mm -hmm. So people, people are um, putting in hours, they are spending emotional capital, and they're working incredibly hard. Mm chasing um, like a, a high score and it it's it's not it's not this isn't a measure of success in the same sense as I guess you could probably say dollars in your bank account isn't a measure of it isn't the the main thing that you should be aiming for either I mean it's, 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 it's you know like I think there are people who can be impact who can make a really big difference in people's lives and in their projects and have a many fewer contributions. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a problem with the number of contributions <laughs> I have. I like guess I don't feel like, but I would far rather, I would far rather say ignore it totally yeah. than lord it over. Do, do you know, do you know yeah, what I mean? I get you. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's not about hitting that score and saying I did all these things. It's like, well, what are you actually doing with each bit that you do? Yeah. Is, is it changing something for someone? I could go out now and contribute every day and because my level of uh, technicality sucks, <laughs> it's going to be 8,000 contributions that did nothing for no one. So if you're doing something really nice and important for someone, that maybe that one contribution outweighs those uh, 16,000, 24,000, you know? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. um, because it's not a measure of value. It's a measure, 
of sheer volume. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if... You, I, I'm, I don't play a lot of computer games, but I, I remember playing, playing computer games growing up, and at some point you would find out a cheat code. Mm -hmm. Okay, So you can have this cheat code, and now you're invulnerable or whatever. Yeah. And at that point, suddenly you start asking the question, like, what is the point? I, I, I found this, like, what is the point of the score? Because I have a cheat code, and I, yeah, of course I can get a high score. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, on GitHub, you can write a script that will give you as many commits or contributions as you want. Yeah. They, they exist. In fact, people were, were, when someone tweeted out about my, um, about the number of contributions I made, people were like, oh, he's got a script. So I don't have a script. But you could, you could create a script. Yeah. Now suddenly, how meaningful is that number? It's not meaningful. You know, it's, you're really going to say that, that the, the thing that's going to define you as a developer is something that anyone can just easily forge? I, I, I don't think so. Like, focus on the things that matter, which is not the number, mm -hmm. but, like, the actual difference you're making to the projects you're involved in. Mm -hmm. That's much more where I would prefer. Because, I, I mean, otherwise, you, you do, you run the risk of that burnout because mm -hmm. you're, you feel like you should be recognized and you're not getting the value back from it. Yeah, that's a wonderful way to look at it. And, and the, what you said there about burnout is important too. And I think it seems to be something that you're, you're wary of because I've heard on your team when you're leading the next team that you try to get everyone to make the plan for next week. Uh, from what I understand, it's interesting. Let's, it's let's inside knowledge there. <laughs> let's cut it here. So we yeah. can spend our weekend, we free our mind from, from things that are going on. Is that something you try to approach in your position or your, your, your kind of role as a leadership to make sure that you, you don't let everybody overwork themselves? I really don't want that to happen. Uh, because open source contribution, you're, you're, I mean, you have work, your work time, you have your, um, I don't know, your family time. Open source is a weird combination of fun time and maybe work time depending on when you're working on it and if your employer is happy for you to contribute. But it's, it's, it's coming out of that, that there's a, it's, not, it's not that you have all the time in the world to do this. Mm. You know, you're making a choice about, am I going to spend this evening watching a film or watching a film and also coding it? <laughs> you know, like that, that, there's that choice. And it needs to be something that brings you fulfillment mm -hmm. and you know, nobody's making someone do this. You know, if someone says they want to contribute to a project, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Nobody's making them do it. They're not going to be paid for doing it. It's, it they're, they're doing it because they want to. Um, and if you don't get reward, if you don't get fulfillment for doing it, you totally can, can burn out. So that's absolutely something I want to avoid. Okay. Um, the reason that I mean, one of the reasons I mention it so often is because it's not because I've personally felt burnout from doing open source, but because I see a lot of people who have. Um, I see a lot of people who probably have experienced it and don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and honestly, I've, uh, there have been people who've told me, oh, I give you six months, you're going to burn out. Well, um, someone, someone told me that when I um, was asked to leave next. So fingers crossed it's been more <laughs> than six months. But... <laughs> But I, like it's, it's one of the things that, that exists mm -hmm. when you have um, a project where you don't have easy boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have, it's not like there's a difference for me in Nuxt between work and hobby uh, and free time. Like I do this because I love it, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. I mean, we all want something like that. But at the same time, the massive downside is what kind of boundary are you putting in place between, you know, the thing that you do in your work day and the thing that you do out of your work day. It's the mm -hmm. same thing, you know. So how do you avoid being sucked in and, and basically, <laughs> and basically uh, burning out? Do, so, you, do you have any approaches in your, in your personal life to avoid mental overload outside of how you kind of construct the team's time? Is there stuff that you do in your own time? Where you say, okay, if I'm going to take this time here, do this now, I know I'll be ready for tomorrow. So um, I so GitHub have a great sort of community for maintainers, which I don't think is publicized that much, but okay. it exists. And I've been to a couple, and and I've been to a couple of um, of sessions they've put on. 
about um, sort of looking after your mental health as an open source maintainer, which I think are great. And okay, I had no idea. Any, interested. any maintainer who's to, to get, see about getting involved. Um, and uh, one of the things that I just can't, that I, I, I'm not sure if this, I'm not sure who to credit for it. But one of the things that I'm trying, but, but it was probably something someone said in one of these sessions, um, is to create moments of um, space mm -hmm. um, when I'm not, uh, when I'm doing, so rather than, because people often talk about boundaries, like that's, that's what people go to immediately. So oh, you should put boundaries. And that has never resonated with me in open source because I don't, I don't, I don't want a boundary. I actually want, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. I want, if I'm watching Netflix in the evening, I want to actually work on, this is fun for me. What, you're stopping me from, that, it, it didn't make sense. But instead to think about creating moments in the day when I do other things that uh, give me a chance to be refreshed in different ways or find meaning in different things. So I have been climbing, for example, this year. I've really enjoyed going bouldering in. Nice. Um, and that's been a lot of fun. And I thought it's not about, okay, I'm going to do this in the evening. It's about, okay, I'm going to do this at two in the afternoon. Oh. Um, and so that is going to give me this like little island of something different that is going to sort of fill my internal wells or whatever and mean that I can keep going into the night. So that, that is something that I've, I found helpful, thinking not so much about boundaries as like little moments of refreshment. And that has been, that's been fun. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's, that's something we do in our office because we have uh, yoga sessions at Prismic okay. three, three times a week around lunchtime. Yeah. Uh, and so I found personally, you might go in after the morning, your, your head's filled with things and it's productive what you're thinking of, but you know, it can feel that way, filled, you know, and you do your yoga session and you breathe and you come out and everything has softened a bit and actually you go back to your work and you find yourself being actually more productive mm -hmm. because you give yourself that moment of space like you've talked about. And I think different kinds of thinking happen at different, in different contexts. Like I think when I'm, when I'm walking somewhere or going for a walk, you can think about vision and plans and mm -hmm big picture a lot better than you can if you're sitting at your desk with a screen in front of you. I don't know about you, but I think it's, I, I, I understand, I've been told that there's a, that if you're in a room with a low ceiling, you'll be much better at focusing on details, mm -hmm. sort of the, the minutia of what you're working on. You're great if you're working with a spreadsheet, you know, and if you're in a room with a high ceiling, you'll be much better at looking at the bigger picture and thinking about the, 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 you know, what's happening over a year and like, where are we going? But I think it's not just where you are physically, but also the kind of thing that you're doing. So not having access to a computer or a phone mm. probably helps you think about some of the big picture things without getting distracted by all the little things that are going to pop in and, and, and maybe that's going to help with the, the vision. So I think, yes, the yoga, you'll be able to think about things there, presumably that you wouldn't be able to think about in your office. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that you released uh, Nox 3.9 yes. on Christmas Day. Yes. As you put it, as a, as a Christmas present for everyone. A cadeau, as you say in France. And uh, I was wondering if people recommend not to release before a weekend. Uh, why release uh, uh, an update on the holidays? What was your thinking there? So. Well, I mean, I often release, uh, I often release before a weekend um, or even on a weekend. I think there are actually some reasons to do that if you're an open source project. So the one, one is it doesn't actually affect anybody unless they choose to upgrade their project. Mm -hmm. So people opt into upgrading their framework. It's not like we're releasing a website which might break and nobody is around to work on it, um, which I guess is mostly what people are afraid of. Uh, but for the framework, by releasing on the weekend or in the holidays, it actually means people can play with it. They can tinker with it because that's some, I mean, that I do that in my free time. I think other devs do that as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, the latest release of Nux is out. I'm going to install it on my website and see how it works. And what that means is, and actually this is generally true about Nux upgrades. We release um, every change to Nux uh, on a special nightly channel. So people can try them out. 
immediately, oh, even wow. before a release. But we also have a whole group of people who will try them out at the moment a release comes out. And it means if there are serious regressions, we can fix them. So um, it's not unknown for us to release something. And I mean, it's not, not super frequent, but for us to release something, someone finds a you know, critical bug and we fix it right away and mm. put a patch out. That is actually really great to be able to do. And so having it weekend means it's, it's actually fixed before, before the weekend is over. Yeah, yeah. And then that way, maybe people aren't working in, in office environments when they find that it's more impersonal projects and things and yeah. more relaxed about the bugs. So there are some reasons I think maybe yeah. it works okay yeah. for, for Nux. That's a completely different perspective. I love it. The, you know, we get fixed in these things. Of, that was what they said in the industry for years, do it like that. And mm. taking a different view is it's refreshing. It's nice. The, the other thing is that there's, there's no time when there's no one who can work on Nuxt. Mm. Because in a business context, you have your sort of Monday to Friday, nine to five. Well, anyway, you have, you have some hours. And the, the weekend is a dangerous time because it is this uncovered time. Mm -hmm. But there is no uncovered time. Mm -hmm. Like there's no day I'm not doing something on Nuxt and or some other contributor isn't doing something. So, you know, it's it. There is no office hours mm -hmm. for an open source framework. Yeah, that's true. So if there's more recurrent schedule of releases that you're doing, these smaller releases for users all the time, we're not going to expect maybe that big jump like you had from Nux 2 to Nux 3 as you move towards Nux 4. No, 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 of course not. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a, a big, a big, breaking change from Nux two to Nux three, and between view two to view three, and honestly, probably the most, ex the, the biggest existential crisis that Nux will ever have. Uh, I very much hope. Um, it took too long. There were too many changes at once. They weren't made in a backwards compatible or a way. Migration was very difficult. And uh, it was it was a case of sort of reassembling the engine of a moving car. It was it was a there were, there were a lot of things that that I think I wouldn't do the same. Um, and we yeah we won't re repeat that. So there will be breaking changes of course, but there'll be breaking changes with straightforward migration paths, um, or opt in to old behavior, that kind of that kind of thing. So very much a lot more hand holding and a lot more sort of straightforward upgrade paths, I think. Okay. And on that note, do you have any kind of sneak previews or ideas or thoughts of where we're going up next for that you can maybe share with people from the community now? <laughs> you... <laughs> so, uh, I mean, this is a very good time to be asking that because I am writing a, um, a sort of an article about my vision for 2024, um, which will be out quite soon. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the things that I can say are we are going to be focusing on um, on the development of web standards and the web platform. Mm. So it's easy to, to think um, at any point to sort of rest on your laurels and think, look, we've done something that's great. But um, the web isn't standing still, and Nux shouldn't stand still either. So this is more. This is a sort of a vision point. So we, we want Nux to be tracking um, both the the cutting edge of what is out there, um, and also the continual development and advancement of the web. I think we also want to be friendly and collaborative mm -hmm. in our approach. We've very much that's been what we've wanted to do with. Um, with creating Nux3 and pulling out all these packages that were before part of Nux and making them um, not a something that we own, even creating a separate organization, UnJS, um, which Puya, who previously led, led the Nux team, is, is now leading, um, and welcoming contribution from other frameworks as well. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, the new hotness of today might be gone tomorrow, but if we collaborate, we are much more likely to create something that, that lasts um, and make sure that we can be around for the uh, foreseeable future as well. It's like a, it's almost like a, a recommitment to the yeah. principles of open source. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. 
And that kind of collaboration, it makes something better for everybody. Um, yes, but that's right. It's easy to get lost in your, in to, to build an empire. You know, we're building the empire of Nux. I don't want to build the empire of Nux. I want to build something that will make people's lives better. Um, and I want, yeah, I want to empower people in, in that kind of way. That's awesome. So, um, and I think I also want to see that in 2024, we're making open source sustainable for mm -hmm. Nux developers and community. And what does that mean exactly, uh, making it sustainable in this case? So that's something that I think every open source developer wants. Um, I think um, I'm interested to see how Nux Labs continues to build products. Mm -hmm. So they sponsor me, for example, and also Puya and Anthony and other members of the Nux core team and, and others in the community. Um, and so they have a couple of projects that they're working on. So Nux UI Pro, for example, um, Nux Studio and Volta. Um, and I would love to see those be really successful um, and for this sort of experiment to continue working well. It's not going to affect my own work on Nux. That's, mm. that's, uh, that's, um, that's separate. But, um, but yes, I think exploring that sustainability question for open source is something that will be uh, be something I'm looking forward to seeing in 2024. Awesome. And um, you were talking of your vision for the next year and talking of your vision of frameworks, which I've seen before. You've mentioned that you believe it should have some magic to it and make you feel, as a developer in the developer experience, there is some magic going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, how do you work that into what you do in your planning for the vision going forward? So it's, so it's, you can't, so the, the, here's the tricky thing. It's very difficult to plan for, um, for magic mm -hmm. because uh, you need to encounter the friction. You need to spot an opportunity in order to create the feature that solves it. Um, and so, therefore, you need to be, one, involved in real projects, using your framework and not just creating it, because otherwise you won't encounter the actual issues of users. Mm -hmm. You'll be at best a, like, you'll be able to triage or fix issues that are coming at you, but you won't have the opportunity to actually look more broadly. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I think is really important for me and other maintainers of Nuxt is actually to be building things. Mm -hmm. Anthony is a great example of this. Um, he's often building new projects and out of those projects come improvements back to Nuxt or other libraries that he's maintaining. And I think it's a great, great pattern. So that's one of the most important things, I think, for, for making magic. I think the other, the other thing, though, is to spot the bigger trends. Like, um, so with Nuxt 3, we bet on serverless and on so like a lot of the, um, the full stack framework direction. Mm -hmm. So, and even before some of that started happening in other frameworks, you know, we worked on it for two years before we released anything. But we, we um, that bigger move towards serverless, towards needing servers that start instantly, towards having full stack capabilities within a Nuxt app, um, shaped a lot of Nuxt 3. I think some of the big picture things that we're looking at, we're looking at obviously large language models. Mm -hmm. So how do you build a framework, for example, that is intelligible and usable by people who are consuming it and partially generating their code with large language models? Mm -hmm. And I have some answers for that, but of course I don't have all of them. But that will be an interesting avenue to explore. Do you, do you have to put any thought into that in terms of how each large language model interacts with Nux, where it gets the information from, how it feeds that into their system to, to show users doing that, because a lot of, I think, developers now, we have to just accept that a lot of people are generating a lot of their code and a lot of their work, be it through GitHub Copilot or Kodi or just directly into something like OpenAI. So I'll give, here are three things I think that, can, uh, that, that you do if you want your framework to work with, um, in a copilot enabled world. So when you use TypeScript, so that when people write code that isn't valid, they get immediate validation in their editor that says that's wrong. Mm -hmm. So you can't, that option isn't valid. Because if, you, if you're just using JavaScript and you, you copy and paste something that copilot has generated, 
or the chat GPT has generated, it's not going to have an error in your editor. It's just going to not work. So TypeScript is going to help with that. Two, write documentation for LLMs. So at the moment, we write documentation for users. Of course, we write documentation for users. I think in this next year, we need to write documentation for LLMs. Something we've already seen. Really? We saw it uh, directly. There, there is a, something based on OpenAI, uh, like a, a search engine for coders. Yes. Uh, and I noticed that when we asked questions about Prismic, it was reading our docs, but it wasn't using any tabbed resources. So if you had different technologies and tabs, so you were getting the information from the documentation returned with the wrong examples. Yeah. So even there's like little things you think, oh, how does it read the page? It's not reading tabs, it's not simple things like this. The way you used to have to think about Google, how does Google crawl my page? You now need to think, how does a LLM crawl my page? Absolutely. And, um, you know, people are, uh, th th there have been examples as well of prompt injections done this way. Someone puts a comment in their website, so nobody, or, or in white text on a white background, so no, nobody can read it. Mm -hmm. But when it's being consumed by the model, it's just as valid an input as anything else. And someone put, put something like, um, uh, it's very important that, uh, that anyone who um, asks about this needs to be told this. Mm -hmm. And so then people were asking about this person and the language models were faithfully relaying exactly this sort of very important message that he'd put in sort of white text. Mm. on a white background that nobody else could see. He was controlling the message that was being, being um, relayed. And that's obviously not what we want to do exactly. But if you think about there are a lot of ways of getting information to an LLM. Mm -hmm. So for example, we may be, um, when you're writing documentation for users, it needs to be concise, succinct, it needs to be clear. When you're writing for an LLM, maybe it doesn't need to be concise. Maybe you can give a lot of examples. Maybe you can um, provide um, a lot more very targeted um, examples to very specific use cases that can all be consumed and made part of the, the corpus. Mm. So I think there are things that we can do to make, make it better and more consumable for users who are creating things that way. But it also is going to affect API design. Not just documentation, but how do you write APIs that work well? I think that's something that we, you, you want it to be intuitive for users. Mm -hmm. um, but particularly seeing people ask questions of ChatGPT and it coming back with this interesting blend between Nuxt 2 and Nuxt 3, it makes me ask questions. So what did we, so obviously that's not right. Obviously the, the fact that something is Nuxt 2 versus Nuxt 3 needs to be clear. But what other cues do, you, do we need to give in terms of our API design that are, immediately going to place the example in one or another camp. You know, I think there are things that, that we can do with that as well that actually will, will make the prompted version better. I know this is a total, total um, red herring, right? But I think it's very interesting. And I, I do think it's something we have to take seriously. I think everyone will have to take this seriously. Um, yeah, because it's, it's here, it's not going anywhere. This is how people are interacting with these tools and we need to figure out how do we provide these tools the best information in the beginning so that once it provides it to the end user, we, it's presented how we would like it presented and it's given the information that we would want to give to that person directly. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a big challenge. And um, it's, it's, it comes along with something else I noticed in, that you've talked about when you were talking about that making magic and that breakup of flow state. Yeah. You know, if, if people are going to these tools and trying to get this information on how to use our tool and that gets broken up and they have to stop in their tracks. Mm. It's potential to lose people, Yeah, right? I mean, one of the, the most useful things, I mean, there are lots of different use cases for, for AI, but, but one, of the, um, one of them is the sort of glorified autocomplete. So, you know, you're, you're writing um, and you're in that flow state, you're creating code um, you know, TypeScript can provide you the autocomplete, your ID can have what goes to this option, what are the valid options I can put here. If you think about uh, chat, uh, Copilot as basically providing you bigger chunks of, of autocomplete. Mm -hmm. um, now, without autocomplete, or if it gets it wrong, it breaks your flow. But the same is true if 
Copilot gives you a chunk that's wrong. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that glorified autocomplete, the autocomplete needs to be reliable and it needs to be sort of in line with what you want to do. So absolutely, it's going to reduce friction if it works well. Okay. Um, and partly, uh, one thing that is going to make that possible also is not just the documentation we create in Nuxt, but also the articles that people write yeah. about Nuxt. And the tutorials and forums apparently is going to be massive as well. Absolutely, and so we have we have this bit where just as we released Next Three, there's nothing. Of course, there's nothing that's been written about it because mm -hmm. it's been in development yeah. and stuff has been changing. Um, and so over the last year, I've been really really pleased as content creators and courses have come out, and there there's actually been a lot of resource that's been created now that Next Three is stable and mm -hmm. exists. So the last thing I'm going to want is for that to be irrelevant. You know, whenever we release our next major version, we still want all of that to be irrelevant, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also something that's going to make it better and better as people rely on it. Yeah, that's an interesting thought too, that, you know, once you release something, people, maybe a lot of people won't even ex have the thought to think, okay, has the large language model caught up already? You know, you have to think, I need to get this information out maybe even before I release something so that these tools or whatever, <laughs> the documentation or something out there that they're going to be able to consume it and give people the right information right away. Um, it's an interesting world we're living in. Honestly, I'm not sure. Would you have, would you have thought that this would be, be the case two years ago, three years ago? No, no. Yeah. But like once it happened, it, it, it made total sense. I don't mm. know. I, I come from the side of the development community, community where it's like I was just a lazy dude <laughs> trying to make the quickest, smallest websites I, I could for local people and the way I always see kind of like a lot of the website building and stuff, I, I still think there's a lot of people like me out there, mm. you know, and I still think they're going to approach it in what is the quickest, laziest way I can get something out there now, give it to a client and I can move on. And I think these tools are enabling that more and more. You know, and we have to be ready for that. And I think the assumption that, oh, it doesn't do it perfectly. It's, you know, we're not going to, we can do better than that ourselves. So, you know, if we give them all the right information here, that's not how people work, really. People are going to choose it. If it doesn't work, they're going to try it again. They're going to do it and go back. Just the one that takes the, the least amount of, I have to go and actually learn something, unfortunately. That's not everybody, of course. You know, I know people who are brilliant and will go and learn something and they can look at documentation and understand something right away. But I'm from the, I just want to type in something, make it work, get it out their side. You say that as though it's a bad thing, but I, I don't think that's a bad thing. And I don't think lazy, being a lazy developer is a bad thing either. Like, you could equally say that you're focused on results. You want to achieve something and you want to take the minimum amount of effort to achieve that. That is good sense, right? Efficiency. Mm. like. That, that you're, you're, you're wanting to, and I think that one of the biggest dangers for developers is that we, f we over, prior we over um, prioritize things that are not priorities. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you could take uh, six months to make it perfect, or you could take one month to make it working. Um, and, you know, you think, well, actually, we want to make it perfect. And time and time again, developers do we want to make things perfect. We want to make things um, optimal and we will refactor and refactor or we will um, uh, over abstract. We'll make something uh, like an abstraction that you can reuse before you even need to reuse it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the worst thing. We, we're so focused on the details, we forget that everything we create is to achieve something that is often outside the scope of development. You know, it's often to empower a business vision or it's to enable a user to do something. And we can lose track of that and think it's about the code and the code is not the most important thing. So I think, yeah, rock on lazy developers. That's, <laughs> that's the, keep, keep focused on what the objective is. Mm -hmm. And I think, yes, Copilot and others help that happen. And they, I think they also help, help people learn too. Yeah, massively. I mean, it's... it's um, it's a way of getting access to information. You know, you'll see a method or something used you didn't know existed. And as long as it's accurate, <laughs> it's a jumping off point yeah. to discover more. Yeah, I see that in, in my role as a, uh, with client support. 
a lot of people are really just coming in. They're just throwing things in and they're back on a stack overflow. People are just copying and pasting and throwing things in. They just want to get things working. Because for them, at the end of the day, it's that, that reward cycle of I've achieved something, I've got something that works, and then they'll come back to it and they'll keep going. And if you can get people to there, I think that's really important. But it's, that, it is a, it's part of a cycle. Mm -hmm. So you paste it in, you make it work, and then you want to try and understand why. Yeah. And refactor it maybe and make it better. Yeah. But like, until you have something that's actually working, you're nowhere. Yeah, exactly. It's, that's the, the wow moment. But I, and I think that's why um, web development is so satisfying to learn mm -hmm. as well, because I, I don't know, I, I get, get served sort of woodworking things in my social media feeds. Oh, you can create this. <laughs> I don't know. I, it's, but I find whenever I need to do anything DIY or whatever, oh, I need to go buy this drill. Yeah. Uh, actually, I need a special bit. Yeah. Uh, okay, I, that seems like I need a different grit sandpaper. <laughs> and like there are all of these things which are obstacles between me and like the next step and, mm -hmm. and doing the thing. And, and on the occasions when I think, okay, I'm gonna buy it in advance, it invariably turns out I didn't understand something enough to know what I actually needed to get. And it's so frustrating. I mean, obviously you can overcome it, but you end up with lots of junk and it costs something and it takes time. Whereas in web development, it's all on your computer. It's pretty much instant. Mm -hmm. There are frustrations, but they can be overcome. As long as you have access to a search engine and a computer, you can almost do anything. And so the iteration cycle between making a mistake and figuring out what went wrong and actually achieving something can get faster and faster. And it, it feels amazing. Yeah, yeah. I feel it's got better and better as yeah. the years have gone on in web development. Like these days, the level of friction is so much smaller than when I yeah. started learning myself. Like things just make sense in a way that they didn't 10, 15 years ago. I know when I was in university and I had to use a CMS for the first time mm. and, and someone showed me what WordPress was and I was like, what, this is a CMS? This is, is, this, can, is it not just something I can just plug into my code? Yeah. And then, you know, it took another, well, I don't know, I were many years until something like Prismic came along, like our company, and when I joined Prismic, I was like, "Oh, this is the this is how I imagined it worked." Yeah, and I think this is where we're we're going now with a lot of that stuff. You know that we are making it so easy that okay, if a developer comes along and he says it should just work like that and it should be that easy, it's that easy now. We're we're the people like yourself here at Nox. You're making like you said that magic moment where they can come. Oh, the framework. I just want to. I just want to get it, a static website, I just want to do my code, the thing that I know, put in the images and stuff that I like and just get it out there. It can work on any sort of platform and that's what you guys are doing here. But I mean, that's absolutely what we want. I mean, and that's why I think modules are such good things, that we can have a Prismic module mm -hmm. that just puts best practices in place, like abstracts any friction that, that might exist otherwise out um, and I think you know, that's the, that's the kind of thing. And it's even easier now. I don't know if you know, but now with the latest version of the CLI, you can just do Nuxi module add Prismic. Wow. Did you know that? And it will, it will install it. It will add it to your next config. And I think it, one of the things we'll see in 2024 is more, more things that we can do automatically out of the box. Add some configuration, um, generate a token, like anything that you might want to do as part of the setup process that otherwise might be a, a tutorial, actually maybe will just happen automatically. Wow, that's awesome. That's amazing. So if there's any viewers watching, go try out the Nux CLI, get Prismic added, test that out, tell us how that went. <laughs> the only other question I have, totally different than anything else, is um, just curious on my level. Nux being a framework for Vue, do you have any direct contact with Evan Yu and, and the team over at Vue.js? How, how often do you, are you in contact with them? Because I imagine it must be a, a huge percentage of Vue users are using Nox. It's the next thing that you want to get straight away because you want your website to be statically rendered and you want all the options that Nox brings for you and all the magic that it gives you. Like, How much uh, communication do you have back and forth when they're about to release a new update and and you want that information so that you're making sure that Nox is ready to work with them right away. Yeah. So we are. We're. Um, so I'm a. I'm a community team member of of you. Mm -hmm. um, so I go to the team meetings on a regular basis. 
um, and we're on a Discord server and we chat. So there's there's great contact. Um, and we're also in the the Vue ecosystem CI. Mm -hmm. So if a change is released that's going to affect Nuxt, um, the Vue team know about it, and okay. we can talk about it. So. Um, and, and this whole ecosystem CI movement, um, I don't know how closely you've been following it, but the idea that you can run test suites mm. before a release to know how it's going to affect projects that depend on you yeah. is really, really been great. So Veet uh, sort of created that. Uh, we've adopted it in Nuxt. Uh, Vue, have it. Vtest, have it. Um, Angular, Svelte, lots of projects use this now. Um, and so one of the things I've been doing is just making sure that we have more projects added to our ecosystem CI. Um, and so when I release a new version of Nuxt, I know, uh, hopefully, I've, I've been through all and made sure that everything is still passing, all of the projects that have been added to it. And I even, I have an open invitation out that if anyone has a downstream project depending on Nuxt, mm -hmm. they can add it to the ecosystem CI. And I will test and know before release whether it's going to break their project or not. Nice. Um, and that is, that's a, a really nice thing. But yes, it exists for Vue as well. So Vue, I think Vue is really picking up the pace in terms of the innovation, the, the pace of releases. Um, I'm really, really pleased. And the team is growing too. Um, and I'm really glad that collaboration is, is really good. That's awesome. And I, I, personally, I, I love to use Noxt and Vue. Like, to, I know there was a lot of changes in the market in terms of you know some frameworks that seem like juggernauts suddenly faded away, but Vue and Nuxt have stuck around, and I think it is because of like you mentioned the developer experience, and for a lot of people they kind of the pathway in is is a lot easier for some understanding. Mm. For myself, I've seen someone on the internet describe it as React is uh, like putting your HTML in your JavaScript, Vue is putting JavaScript in your HTML. Mm. As simple as that. And that's why, for myself, when I started to learn, Vue just made sense for me so much quicker. Yeah. Um, do you think uh, you're going to see a lot of changes in the, the, the offerings of frameworks with Svelte coming around and stuff like that? How do you see it kind of the future of the, the framework uh, options out there going recently? I think, I think there'll be more frameworks that we have not even seen. Um, I think there's there's always a there's I think there's a trajectory when some new something new comes out where it becomes very popular and then you have to see whether it's going to last and stay stay the course um, and that that sort of longevity is really I think important. There's also an arc where something that has stayed the course you have to see is it going to um, petrify or is it going to stay innovative mm. like Angular for example. For a long time, we didn't see any significant change. We've seen amazing stuff happening. Yeah. They're a great example of a framework that is, has the sort of longevity, but also still has innovation. Mm -hmm. And I would want Nuxt to be that. I would want us, we, we prove that we have longevity. Mm -hmm. I would want to see that we still have innovation and we keep staying at the bleeding edge. Um, what do I think is going to happen with frameworks? I think at the moment, you know, New runtimes are coming out. Bun, you know, Cloudflare Workers has been around for a while as an environment. There are little frameworks that are springing up that are focusing on those. I think we, um, I think we have a lot. I hope we can collaborate. So uh, I've been I'm really delighted to see that Solid Start is built on top of Nitro. Um, so we now have Nuxt, Solid Start, Analog, which is an Angular meta framework, all built on top of Nitro as a server rendering one. Uh, and I think it'd be nice to see some more frameworks that are also collaborating um, on the underlying core uh, that, that renders a lot of the front ends. Nice. So the open source community supporting each other all around. Exactly. And that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. That was, that was really awesome. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah. And for people out there who haven't tried Nox with Prismic yet, you can try out uh, this tutorial that Lucy put together for us. It's a fully fledged website using Prismic and Nox that'll get you from start to finish and get you some results fast. Uh, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.